every time.
every promise, in every prayer I take. I believe, I believe that you are provider, you are protector, you are the one I love. I believe you are. flesh dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten and we thank you Jesus that you came and lifted us even when we were lost in our sins and transgressions even though there were walls and chains God we thank you that you broke down those walls and chains so we lift you up this morning Jesus as a way maker chain breaker wall destroyer we praise you this morning God and ask that you be glorified as we worship you now through our giving and through the word and the proclamation of your truth. We love you, and it's for your name's sake we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome to Horizon South Bay. Will you please greet those around you? Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning out there, right field, left field, depending on what side you're sitting on. Mm. We are blessed to have you with us this morning on uh, this wonderful, beautiful, what do you call it, pre-summer, late spring, almost there, June 13th Sunday service. Welcome if you're watching us on our Facebook, uh, YouTube channel. Pastor Jim's going to be sharing this morning. He's going to be in uh, Romans. Chapter 16, that's the last chapter. He's going to start in verse 17. How many years have you been teaching on uh, Romans? Ten years? Yeah, he's right up there with Norlin, right? So we're blessed to have that, have him with us. Uh, also, if you're joining us virtually, um, you want to, today is communion. 
Communion Sunday, so make sure that you get your elements ready. We'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of service. Um, normally, you know, on Sunday mornings, one of the one most precious things about meeting outside was being able to smell the bacon, right? Well, today you're going to be smelling hamburgers because the youth group are going to be serving hamburgers after service. So, uh, yeah, so stick around. Um, for their fundraiser, it's a, just a donation only, and uh, they'll hook you up with some good food. We have men's breakfast coming, uh, kind of reserved the date, June 26, 9 to 11. It's going to be at the door, so if you're interested, men, in going, let me know so I can get a, some sort of account going here. Um, women's ministry, needing to serve, which is a, a bread-making ministry. Where are you? Oh, there you are, Doreen. If um, women, if you're interested in that, you can talk to Doreen. That's going to resume June 27th. Also on June 27th, that Sunday, uh, I'll have food again. You know how the food ministry, I bring food every fourth Sunday or last Sunday of the month. So bring your bags. Um, and lastly, if you're still interested in helping with um, the orphanage in Rosarito, Comidor, you can help by uh, clicking on the link that's on your uh, flock note that you get every Sunday morning, or you can see um, uh, Regina or Eric about that. Let's pray for today's service and today's tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this wonderful day. We thank you for the grace that you've bestowed on each one of us, Lord. We thank you for your mercy, Lord, that is new every single morning. We ask you to join us, that you'd have freedom in this place, that your Holy Spirit would anoint Jim, Pastor Jim, and would just anoint this service free up our hearts and minds, and they just bless our tithes and offerings, and they be used for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Dean. Good morning. Good morning. Cheers. I'll see how we do. Today's a very special day, being the, I expect to finish Romans. But it's also a special day. On the count of three, uh, would you all holler out, happy birthday, Pastor Norlin. He's supposedly watching. Today's his birthday. Ready? One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Pastor Norlin. I know you hated that. All right. The what? How many years? That We're keeping that as a secret. Um, we're turning to Romans 16, wrapping it up. We will have communion afterwards. Uh, we're going to tie it into the last verse or so. Uh, looking back, we started this journey. I was looking at, uh, I keep notes, uh, a spreadsheet of all the messages, not just mine, everybody's. And it was uh, Sunday, February 27, 2011. Wow. That was a lot of, a lot of water has gone under the ridge since then. And um, it was shortly after my... Uh, I proposed to my wife, so that was, it was a very good year, and it happened because on Saturday night, if I recall correctly, I got a call saying, I'm sick, I can't make it, can you cover? Uh, and uh, I'm like, Saturday night, <laughs> and I went, what is in my heart, what do I love, uh, what am I most familiar with, and it's Romans, I love Romans, it's my favorite book in the Bible, in case anybody's unaware of that fact, um, and I'm hoping that it's yours too, and in fairness, I do go a little slow, but that averages out about three or, yeah, ten years, so maybe three or four times a year, I'm getting a shot at doing Romans. Um, man, it's, it isn't the longest book in the Bible, but it is a very long letter, and Paul takes his time in concluding it. And out of the 16 chapters, his final greetings take, it takes about one and a half chapters. And now that we're in the middle of that ending, he unexpectedly, seemingly, gives a warning to us. And now I'm going to pray. Lord, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Romans 16, verse 17. And if you have Bibles, please get them out, because we'll be looking at stuff in there. It's pretty interesting. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye 
on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Leon Morris, he suggests that these verses are in context with verse 16, which reads, Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. And that is because uh, this greeting, this harmony of verse 16 can be so easily disrupted by someone coming in and causing division. And so it's a very good warning there. Uh, Paul warns about two specific things in there. You see those who cause dissension or division. Uh, uh, conflict is their MO. That's what they like to do. They love conflict. And the Bible warns us to fully vet anyone seeking to teach in our church. And that's probably why Norland's watching right now, just to make sure I'm holding the line. So far, so good. <laughs> Pray for me. Um, Usually, they end up partic uh, pushing a particular doctrine or teaching. And everybody has, you know, favorite things like, do you do this? Do you do this? And 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 uh, I remember as a young Christian, uh, a, a friend of mine always said, "Keep the main thing, the main thing, and that's Jesus." So that's what we're doing. Um, they would come in and they'd ignore the important truths to focus in on this one pet truth, and then that would end up pulling the fellowship apart. And then he says also those who put obstacles before others. We're in 17. Uh, it's like what the Pharisees did. In Matthew 23, 4, it says the Pharisees tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders. So instead of just loving the Lord, oh, well, Pharisees weren't like loving Jesus, but here, but instead of just loving Jesus, it's like loving Jesus and this stuff here. Uh, the other stuff's important, but the main thing needs to be the main thing. And these people, they don't deny the essentials. Hold that page down. Um, they just started adding extras. And in the Greek text, the words are para, which means alongside, and didache, which means teaching. So it's alongside the teaching. So here's the teaching about Jesus. And then they start adding little things. And like the Pharisees, it starts to weigh down on people and get them off the main track. So it's a, other teachings brought alongside Scripture. No one should be allowed to put us under that kind of bondage. Uh, even if I'm dealing with a, a, a young Christian and they have, you know, the issues, the main focus is always on Jesus. Point them to Jesus. And as they draw close to him and get some counsel they're going to end up doing the right thing. It's not our job to actually change people. That transformation comes from drawing close to Jesus. And so it's very important there. So we are to keep our eyes open for people that come in to bring division in the body. We're to watch out for them. The Greek word is scopio, from which we get scope. So we're to watch out from the, for them and to be aware of them. And... Uh, um, yeah, anyways, let's look at verse 18. It says, For such people are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. So Paul, he comes down pretty hard on those who come into a church and start to divide or confuse people. False teachers are to be shunned like the plague. They're operating from a personal standard and not from the biblical standard. Uh, so there's a tremendous need in the body of Christ for discernment and to be aware of these things and recognize that prevention is better than cure. If you get somebody in there and let them just confuse everybody, and we are like sheep, it's a good example. We get confused easily sometimes. It sounds good. It tickles the ears, but it's pulling us away from the main thing, and we need the main thing. And Paul, being a wise pastor, He's putting out the spark before the forest fire starts. Um, There's lots of stuff like that they had, he had to deal with. So they deceive the unwary by their smooth and flattering speech. I do like the NIV translate. It translates it smooth talk. Their smooth talk uh, gets us confused. It captures the thought well. So they're, they're counterfeits as opposed to true saints who follow Jesus in all things, and serve one another. So what do we do? Like I said, be discerning. Uh, I don't necessarily like the term. It's a good term, but we mark them. 
and avoid them. You, there's no need to argue with them. Uh, it, if you start this argument process, that fuels uh, division. Uh, but if you just avoid them, eventually they become quiet. Or, or they leave to try and cause trouble somewhere else. Those are hard words, but it's important in a church, and um, Paul's right to address it here. Now, look at verse 19. We have communion, so be prepared for that. I'm trying to make sure I stay on time here. Uh, and these are all in, in context. There were no verses when the Bible was, this letter was written. It was a letter. And these verses are connected. So when we say in 19, sometimes we just separate the thoughts. But context is king, so always look for it in context. In 19, he says, For the report of your obedience has reached everyone. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. How would you like Paul to say that about you? I'm rejoicing over you because of your obedience. Like, yeah, thank you. I'm going to be more obedient. <laughs> um, Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I am sending, this is Jesus saying, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be as wary as serpents as, and as innocent as doves. Also good, be smart. Be biblically grounded and be smart. Um, we're to watch out for those who cause dissension, turn away from them. Uh, so that means there's a lot of, unfortunately, television preachers, not all of them, but they really have, you know, messed up some people. Um, and so we have to be wary of that and those kind of teachings and always like, be like a Berean in Acts, check it with the Word of God. Uh, there's a lot of good preachers out there, too. But I know what about television preachers. Uh, not all of them, but that's where they flourish. I think it's because it's a money market and for a lot. And I'm not going to name names or anything, but be wise. Be wise about what your little eyes see, uh, what you read. Make sure it's something that's building you up and not tearing you down, turning you towards Jesus and not away from him, uh, keeping the main thing the main thing. Uh, we're to, it says here, we are to know about evil, be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. So we're to know about evil, but you don't have to know everything about evil. You don't have to make it your study. Study the good, be wise and, and innocent in the evil. Always focus in on what is good. What, what you know, computer guys, Gigo, right? Uh, one laugh, one laughter, one person. Giggo. Garbage in, garbage out. If you're letting garbage come in, guess what's going to come out? Garbage. That's right, garbage. So don't, don't do that anymore. Uh, a good place to start if you want some really good Romans. That's what we're doing now. It's great. I love this book. It's awesome. It's spectacular. Um, then 20. It says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Uh, this little short sentence, it seems unexpected in this flow because it's like we're dealing with the problems in the church and greetings from people and all this other little stuff. And it's like very localized in a way. And now he just jumps into the supernatural. It's like from the material to the supernatural. It's a big leap. At least it feels that way. God is the God of peace as opposed to the discord that false teachers bring. And, and um, you know, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood with the powers and principalities. Uh, all this stuff we're doing here, this is local. But there is a supernatural battle going on, even now as we sit in church. And we have to be aware of that and recognize we're part of something bigger than just sitting here amongst people. And that bigger influences our local. And, and that's how we're to live our lives. God is the God of peace. And there's going to be an ultimate doom of Satan. 
we see him rampant, and, and the closer we come to the return of Christ, it's going to push even harder. If he finds out that, or sees you that you're becoming stronger in Christ, he's going to attack you in any way possible. And we've got to recognize that. But the promise is that God will break, shatter, and crush Satan. And that's going to happen. We live in a world, a secular world, and, and everything is recognized. They recognize only the material, what can be seen, heard, touched, uh, smelled, and tasted. That's their only reality. That's it. They don't recognize the supernatural. But the, the supernatural is real. God is real. Uh, when they focus just on the material, and we see this in even in the United States today, if you're just focused in on the material, guess what? You're eliminating God. And we don't do that here. Uh, for them, spiritual matters don't matter. That's why um, uh, the battle with uh, the governor of California and the COVID stuff and how they shut down churches because uh, they're not essential. He doesn't recognize the supernatural. It's only the material. And we even had, I love the fact, they, uh, there was two judgments again, uh, for two churches in California. Um, uh, they sued the governor. Unfortunately, we're going to pay for that because we're taxpayers, and they're just going to push it onto us. But the judgment was churches are important, and you can't treat them differently. Costco essential and church not. I mean, I love Costco. <laughs> Ask my wife. <laughs> uh, uh, but church is way more essential than Costco. So, and then Christians, we're often accused of being soft on battles that the world thinks are important or urgent, like poverty, hunger, injustice, trafficking, call, there's a bunch. They're real problems. Uh, we need to seek solutions for them. Um, but if these problems of the world are material and visible, why haven't they been solved and eradicated years ago? They've been working on this the whole time. Well, guess what? They've ignored the real power to help in all these issues. Um, it's, it's obvious. Ephesians 6.12 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Wow. Remember where the battle really is. And if you're getting upset on a local level, check your heart. See if it's actually something bigger than that that's going on. And let God bring his grace into that. So these are surprising phrases. I'll look at them real quickly. Uh, why would the God of peace crush anyone, much less Satan? God of peace crushing, that doesn't seem to make sense. Sounds like he's uh, pretty hostile. Two, we have the crushing of Satan under our feet. That also seems weird because Genesis 3.15 says, uh, I will... Uh, um, the Lord talking, he says, I will make enemies of you and the woman and of your offspring and her descendant. He shall bruise you on the head, talking to Satan, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So here we have this descendant bruising, crushing Satan. So how do we do it? How do we get into this picture? Uh, and uh, when Paul's writing this, you can tell he's, he's referencing Genesis 3.15, and, and these are uh, parallel prophecies, one in the old and the new. And it says the crushing of Satan is to happen soon. Okay, this verse was written 2,000 years ago. Uh, so Satan doesn't seem crushed yet. Have you noticed anything? Okay, no. Nothing much has changed since Paul wrote Romans. You could go to chapter 1 and read what went on there. It's the same stuff that's happening now. So comparing both verses, we'll do this kind of quickly. Make sure I get my timing right here. So why would God, of, the God of peace, crush anyone, much less Satan? Uh, that goes back to us understanding the character of God. Remember, Satan asked the woman, uh, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Why would God do that? He's a good God. He wouldn't be mean to you like that and I'll let you eat that fruit. And uh, if, so the reasoning is, if God is so good, why does he put restrictions on us? He wouldn't do that. Well, then that, you've got to think about what's your definition of good. God's always looking at the ultimate good, not just what will make you feel good at the moment. 
Our failure comes when we don't understand what real goodness is. And when things are going haywire in your life, this makes me tear up, when things are going haywire in your life, and you wonder, like, why are you doing this to me, God? You have to fall back on the character of God, his goodness. I may not understand what he's doing, but God is good, and I know I can trust him. And I fall on what I know about God. His character is good. God, God's goodness gives us beneficial rules according to his moral nature. Uh, his goodness doesn't avoid conflict at all costs. Um, he, he doesn't hide or uh, hide from or avoid hostility. It's an active attribute. His peace is there. It makes peace where hostility existed beforehand. And God is called the God of peace, of peace because he makes peace by crushing Satan. That will happen. God's goal is ultimate good. And how about us? It says there, why is the crushing of Satan under our feet? When we speak of salvation, we speak about um, we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. There's the three tenses. And it's the same thing here about um, um, when we speak of Jesus' victory over Satan, we can say that Satan has been defeated at the cross. He is being defeated on a daily basis by us, and he will be defeat, defeated. Now, the past and future tense of this defeat of Satan that has been and will be accomplished by Jesus alone. But we play a part in the present tense of the defeat of Satan. And that's why he says, God, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. We need to man up and woman up and let and defeat Satan on a daily basis. Uh, yep, thank you. Um, so that's why Paul says in 19, I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Because if you remember, the sat Satan said to Eve, God knows that on the day you eat, it, eat from it, this is the tree of good and evil, uh, your eyes will be opened and you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. So do you see the connection there? Now Paul says, I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Uh, when we live according to verse 19, we're crushing Satan. We're crushing Satan when we live according to verse 19. Being wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. So we must keep that up. God will crush Satan as we follow him. Every day, crush Satan. Every day, crush Satan. Uh, but please remember, we're to use the weapons that God has provided us. The, the weapons of the world, there's power, money, politics, numbers. Our weapons are the word of God and prayer. Amen. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. I love this passage. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's your marching orders. And the crushing of Satan is going to happen soon. Soon has two meanings. It can mean quickly. And it's not like it's not going to take much time. Or near at hand. Uh, so it can mean that when God crushes Satan, it will happen quickly, or that this crushing is just around the corner. Um, what crushing is Paul referring to? It is the victory of believers living by the truth of God's word and doing what is right. Here, I'll say it again. It is the victory of believers living by the truth of God's word and doing what is right. When we do what is right, God is glorified and Satan fails. Don't let him win any battle in your life. Every victory we have over Satan 
even if it's a small one, it points to the great and final victory of Jesus Christ over Satan and all of evil. And he's coming back soon. Man, I feel like I want to stop there. Okay, verse 20, I mean 21. Well, no, he says, uh, and then he moves into, and uh, ah, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Uh, so that whole verse, it's, it's a great benediction to a letter. But we've seen Paul has written two previous benedictions. He has a hard time signing off, and we're thankful for it because it's great stuff. Romans 15, 13 had a benediction about the God of hope filling you with all joy and peace. And then 1533, now the God of peace be with you all. And now this one here, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. So we had hope and peace and joy. And now we're ending in grace. <sighs> grace is a cool breeze when you're hot and sweaty. And that's what it is. Amazing Grace is one of the most sung and recorded songs of all time. It was written in 1779 by John Newton. He was a slave trader who turned preacher. You can say it with me if you remember it. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. What do you think about Grace. Makes me smile. Theologians have all kinds of names for grace, a common grace, electing grace, irresistible grace, and, and they break it down like that. But saving grace, wow. Grace is the greatest theme in Scripture, and Paul writes about it a lot. This isn't as fun on video, just recording when I'm doing wiping my nose. Okay. So 2 Peter 3.18 says, admonishes us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Oh, that, that's a great verse. 2 Peter 3.18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, for that to happen, we need to be students of God's word. We need to meditate on its uh, teachings. We need to continually spend time with Jesus. because That's that the relationship that... that covers everything else grace is a must have in order for us to follow and serve jesus and grace isn't like you know a one-time gift it's a daily continual resource and it's a, the greatest need of our lives grace and there's an unlimited supply so and god's not stingy so please receive grace it's there. Why would you not? It's like, you know, I have a thousand dollars. Anybody want it? No. No, I don't think I deserve it. No, give it to somebody else more deserving than me. Uh, no, there's enough for everybody. Receive the grace of God and take your marching orders and run with it. All right, so let's move on. Uh, the first part of chapter 16, there's a list of Christians in Rome. Now we come to a list of Corinth, Christians in Corinth. That's where Paul wrote the letter. And so I get this picture. He we'll see later. He's staying at the house of Gaius, and, and uh, he's writing a letter. I'm about done here. Well, actually, somebody else is writing it for him. Paul is dictating it, and they're like, hey, could you say hi for me? Uh, and Paul's not thinking, I am writing God's word. I mean, maybe he did, but no, he's like, I'm writing a, Rome, uh, a letter to the Roman Christians. Our brothers are to encourage them. And so it's a letter. And so he's writing this letter, and the others around at Gaius' house, and like, could you say hi for me? And they're like, wait, I want to say hi too. So then we got this uh, list of people that are all saying hi. And anyways, it's really cool. Um... 21, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, and so do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsman. Timothy was a, a convert of Paul, a young understudy, um, fellow worker. He picked up Timothy and Lystra uh, on his second missionary journey. Timothy had a Greek father, a Jewish mother, 
And he, he loves Timothy. In Philippians 2, he wrote, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your wel welfare, but you know of his proven character, that he served me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. So he, he loved Timothy. He thought very highly of him. And uh, then we have Lucius and Jason and Sosipater. They're kind of linked together. And we're not quite sure. Uh, Origin. he was a church father. He thought Lucius may have been Luke, but that's probably not true because he calls him kinsman, so it probably means uh, either Jewish or a relative of some sort. And we know that that Luke was a Gentile. And um, there's a Lucius from Cyrene in Acts. He could have been the same one. We don't know. And Jason, we see him in Acts 17. He was one of the first converts there. So he was a Thessalonian who hosted Paul and Silas in his home. So Sipater, uh, in uh, Acts 20, I think Norla mentioned him last week, uh, we had Sopater of Berea. And so Sipater is most likely that person too, so it's more of a nickname. And so they seem to be like appointed representatives gathering at Corinth, maybe for the journey to Jerusalem. And then we come to 22, I, Tertius, who have written this letter, greet you in the Lord. Tertius is a Latin name. It means third. And numbers, uh, uh, names based on numbers are often slave names like Primus, Secundus, Tertius, Quartus, Quintus. Uh, and though they're slave names, we have a negative connotation and for a good reason. But it often denoted um, importance or status in the household. Uh, any Star Trek fans? Captain Picard and uh, uh, Commander Riker. What does he say? Make it so number one. Make it so, number one. so it's kind of like that. Uh, uh, so now you guys are laughing. Okay. So Tertius was Paul's secretary, or Emanuensis is what it's called. Um, we see in Galatians chapter 4, Paul talks about uh, seemingly a bodily illness, and he referenced it, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. So there's some thought that Paul had some kind of eye disease, and so he had other people take dictation from him, and Tertius jumps in here to help Paul. Um, since Paul stayed at Gaius's home, Gaius probably enlisted Tertius, the number three slave or servant in his household, to help him. Uh, and here he greets him personally, I, Tertius, who have written this letter, greet you in the Lord. I like that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. Do you mind if I put down that I wrote this? <laughs> uh, and then the phrase, in the Lord, it's usually after greet you in the Lord by translators, but in the Greek text, the phrase comes after who have written this letter. So it literally reads, I, Tertius, who have written this letter in the Lord, greet you. That's a different focus there. Uh, he wrote this letter unto the Lord. So he's doing this as a service. He's just writing a letter, but he's doing it as unto the Lord. Uh, I like what Ephesians 6 says, With good will render service as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, he will receive this back from the Lord, whether slave or free. So whatever you do, small task, big task, do it as unto the Lord, do it joyfully, do it well. And we have Gaius in verse 23. Gaius, host to me, and to the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greet you, and Cordus, the brother. Uh, there are a few Gaiuses mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, the only one that I really think it might have been was in Acts 18, and, and we tie 1 Corinthians 1.14. So 1 Corinthians says, I am thankful that I baptized, Paul saying this, I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. And we go to Acts 18, it says... Uh, talks about he went to the house of a man Paul went to the house of a man named Titius Justus which we think is Gaius a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue Crispus the leader of the synagogue believed in the Lord together with his entire household and many of the Corinthians as they listened to Paul were believing and being baptized so there's the connection that Gaius uh, was that same person and so he was probably one of the first converts of Paul in Corinth. Erastus was a city treasurer of Corinth, probably a friend of Gaius. 
Uh, in the biblical archaeologist, uh, there's an article there. It was, um, they had, there was a paving block that they, was being reused, and it had an inscription on it, and it stated that the pavement was laid at the expense of Erastus. That's probably the same one. I mean, I can't put my bank account on it. Um, but, yep, I think so. So the church was really diverse. Look around. We're the church. We're pretty diverse. It's good to see you all. Uh, it's amazing. And then in Cordus, he, uh, that's Latin for fourth. Um, according to tradition, uh, he also appear, apparently might have been a part of Gaius' household. But for church tradition, he's known as Cortus of Beritus. That's modern-day Beirut. It says he, uh, that tradition says he suffered for the faith. And he was numbered among the 70 disciples in Luke chapter 10. So that's pretty interesting. It also says that he converted many to the faith. I don't know if you have a verse 24, because it's not there. Um, it's omitted in most Greek texts. Later manuscripts added it in there, and the later manuscripts add, added, uh, the grace of our, our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. Well, that was also in verse 20, so that's why they've taken it out. The oldest manuscripts don't support it, and it seems just to be a scribal error of copying it. And those things happen. Um, so Christians of the early church, I know we got critical race theory. Theory, uh, the, the world wants to separate everybody, make distinctions, how different we are. There's only one race. That's the human race. Doesn't matter what color, how short or tall you are. We should have a bald race and a hairy race. <laughs> Let, let's just get that over with. Okay, um, but. The world focuses on differences, but here we have masters and slaves, rich and poor, Romans and Greek, male and female, Jew and Gentile, commoners and public officials, young and old. But what they held in common was the love for Jesus Christ. That's the church. We love Jesus, and we're here to serve him. Love transformed all these people, whatever their differences were, and they became one body in Christ. Each one is important, and no one is more important than the other. Amen. Um, <laughs> I'm flying. i got five minutes. Okay, and then we have a doxology ending it. This is the third and final benediction, though it's more common as a, uh, a doxology. A benediction is uh, like a, a, a blessing, and a doxology is more about praise. So, this closes the third section and the entire letter. And Paul began the letter focused on what God the Father has done through his Son, and he ends it the same way. You all have your communion? Because we're going to tail into this soon. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now has been disclosed and through the scriptures of the prophets in accordance with the command of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Bam. Mic drop by Paul. <laughs> so, who is able? That's important. I love that. God is able. That's who is able. He's sovereign. He's almighty. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. The power of God can work through you. It's, he, we, uh, he's able to establish you. That means to prop up, to make stable, to firm, to solidify, to strengthen. And, and it's a daily dipping into the grace of God to grow in strength. We see that same word used back in Romans 1. That's why I see Paul wrapping up, the, tying the two ends of the end of the letter and the close of the letter into a bow. He says, uh, I long to, to see you and to impart a spiritual gift that you may be established 
He's establishing in the beginning. He's establishing now for us. Paul wants strong Christians. God wants strong Christians. I want strong Christians. I want to be a strong Christian. What do you want to be? How will this happen? Verse 25 says, God is the one who is able to establish you. So you need to draw close to God. Romans is not Paul's book. It's God's. His very words to you to establish you in the faith. And I like that Paul calls my, my gospel. It doesn't, he's not being selfish, like you can't have it. <laughs> it's mine. Uh, he's saying, uh, I have personally embraced the gospel. That's what my gospel is. Whew. Yeah, that's good. He also mentioned that in chapter 1, set up, he said he was set apart for the gospel of God, his gospel. That's great. The gospel is all about Jesus. That's why we're going to take communion today. He was the one who was promised. He's the one who came. He's the one who will come again. Jesus Christ is preeminent. Number one in the Romans, in the Bible, in our lives, hopefully. It's beautiful. In verse 26, the Old Testament to Paul was a Christian book. That's how he looked at it. I don't, I don't know his thinkings about writing this letter, but it's quite impactful. Um, we saw this mystery of God that he talks about revealed in chapters 1 through 4 regarding salvation through justification, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Chapters 5 through 8 was sanctification by God who has given us a new nature, the nature of Jesus Christ, the very life of Jesus in us to produce good works corresponding to his nature. We saw this mystery revealed in uh, the nine, chapters 9 through 11, the, uh, the history of from Jew to Gentile and how God was moving there. And his wisdom is displayed throughout Hmm. And then in 12 on was all about the application of all of this. And now we come here to the very last verse. This verse reveals the purpose again, to believe and to obey. This is the obedience of faith mentioned in chapter 1, verse 5. We don't, I mean, we kind of do, but you don't pick and choose who we share the gospel with. We proclaim the good news wherever we are and to whomever is there. If you're there and there's somebody that needs to hear the gospel, guess what? You're today's missionary. You're today's evangelist. We got to remember that. The gospel must be proclaimed to everyone. Uh, this, the great commitment it says right there, known to all the nations. God commands us to take the gospel to all the world. Which part of the world do you live in? Okay, you, you take that corner, I'll take this corner. That's why Paul became a missionary. That's why he wrote this letter. Teach the gospel, spread the gospel, proclaim it. And then he says, he offers praise for the person of God. In verse 27, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm, I'll wrap up real quick here. Isaiah 45 says, I am the Lord. There is no one else. There is no God except me. I will arm you, though you have not known me, so that people may know from the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no one else. No one else. He is above time and space. He transcends all of this. He is to have first place in our hearts, our lives, and our affections should only belong to the Lord. And as it says right there, through Jesus Christ, this God can only be known through his son, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for you, that you might be born again and saved, sin erased, filled with the nature of God. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Philip told him, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus said, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. And he amens. Amen is at the end of the book. The word amen, amen is found in like half the languages of the world. And amen refers to that which is true, firm, sure, faithful, reliable. And that's why he's saying amen. Amen at the end of the letter. Can you add your amen to that? Amen. So, this, this makes, I feel like, totally heavy, responsible. Uh, we've looked at Romans. You've received truth as we went through Romans. Incredible truth. You are now responsible for that truth. You can't walk away and not be the person God's called you to be. You are responsible for the truth that Romans, that Paul has written. It is now yours. You must embrace it. So what will you do with it? Who will you be because of the truth of God's word? open that up. Communion is all about remembering. We remember what Jesus did. We've talked about it. Amazing. And it's also about remembering, I like in Matthew, if I can find it real fast, between my teary eyes. Um, <sighs> okay. Help me, Lord. There it is. Um, he talked about the bread and the blood. And he says, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's coming back. We declare it. And we, we are so thankful for what he did for us. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for what you did on the cross, for the bruised body of Jesus Christ taking my place. It should have been me there. It should have been us there. But instead, you laid down your life for us. The perfect sacrifice that purchased us from the grip of Satan and gave us new life. We thank you. We give you praise. Let's take the cracker together. And Lord, we thank you for the blood that you spilt on behalf of us. And yet, as we look back, we also remember that as we drink this cup, we will drink with you again new in your Father's kingdom. And we look forward to that day. Help us to be strong and hold down the fort and advance your kingdom while here on earth. We commit ourselves to this. And once again, as we receive this cup, we reaffirm our commitment and love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And we have prayer. Chris and Monique will be over here if you'd like to pray with somebody. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Will you stand as we worship? Sing Hosanna.
Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Grace and peace be with you.